All right, for day two now, this ACP review, we're gonna look at, we're gonna start with parametrics. What parametric are, petri, parametric equations are any equations that involve the letter T. If you remember, T stands for time. And I've kind of rolled up a second topic in there, projectile motion, because they use the letter T. But for a lot of students, they see them as two different types of problems. So uh, you could consider this one type or two types, but either way, it's that has the letter T. That's what we're gonna deal with today. So let's start with on your packet number one. Number one has a T. So looking at number one, if you remember your algebra, the way we solved when you have a letter T is you use substitution from algebra two. Your step one was you use one equation, you solve for the shared letter. Step two, you plug in that shared letter into the other equation. And step three, you reduce it. That was the three algebra steps. Now I can say those steps really quickly, but it took a long time to actually do. Let's show how quickly we can use the calculator to solve this. Here's what we're gonna do. Once you see that there's an equation with T, do you see those T's? Yes or no, do you see the T's in the problem? When you see T's, I want you to go to a new document and you, you can just hit don't save every time. Hit add a graph. And once the graph comes up, hit menu, graph entry, menu three for graph entry. Parametric are the equations with the T. Now, when you do that on the Inspire, Inspire is a lot easier than Desmos for parametric. It does parametric better, way better than uh, Desmos. It'll break up your X and Y equations. So you just type them in as given. Now, this is telling you, this is informing you when it says X1 of T in parentheses, that's telling you that you have to use the letter T. You must use the letter T, nothing else. So we have to use the letter T, which they did. So we're good there. So it's going to be T squared plus 5T minus 1. That's my X equation. My Y equation is T plus one. Now on the third line in the calculator, it has the restriction for time. Often uh, on our tests, they will not give you the T's restriction. Uh, you're gonna make one adjustment if they don't give you a time. I want you to change the zero to a negative five. I'm gonna say that again. If they do not give you a time restriction, just change the zero to a negative five. That's the only change we're going to make. Never touch the T step. That's just for the calculator. Don't worry about that. But do change the zero to a negative five if it doesn't give you a value. Okay, press enter. You should see a graph. It looks like somewhat like a sideways parabola. Are y'all getting the same graph as me? Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Now, when you look at your answer choices, do you see T's in these problems? No. So we're not going to graph that as parametric. These we're going to graph as a relation. If it only has an X or a Y, or both in this case, both X's and Y's, you're gonna graph it as a relation. So a relation could graph anything that's just an X, that's just a Y, or in this case, both X's and Y's. So now here's how you do that. Press menu, graph entry, and hit relation. Now, the way uh, the Inspire works is your first equation will always be in blue. So this says relation one, it would also be in blue. If you want to change color, you could press like the down arrow and relation two would graph as red. To me, it doesn't matter, but I'll put it in as red just so you can see clearly what equation is what. I'm going to type in answer choice A here and I'm going to try it. X equals Y squared minus five Y plus three. When I hit enter, you can tell me quite quickly whether or not these are the, this is the right answer or incorrect answer. What do you think? No. Why no? Oh, sorry. They're known overlap. So if you press the tab button, when you press the tab button, it'll pull up your equation line. Now it pulls up a blank one every time. It'll always pull up a blank one. Uh, the red was on relation two. So I'm gonna press the down arrow to get from one to two. When I press that, now I can change my equation again, and I'm going to edit to B's equation. So it's going to be Y squared plus 5Y this time. So I need to change mine to plus 5Y. And it's going to be a minus 3 this time. Minus 3. I'm going to hit enter. What do you think about that? Is that the correct answer? No. So again, I'm going to press tab. Tab will always give you a blank equation. It's so mine is relation one. I need to get back to relation two. So I'll press the down arrow. For you, you might be pressing tab up. Depends on where you typed it in. Uh, let's try this one. It's plus three this time. 
y squared plus 3y minus 5. I'm going to try this graph. What do you think about that one? Yeah. That's it. We found the correct answer. The correct answer is C. So you could try D, but uh, we just discovered here that is the exact same graph. If you click on the blue over there, double click it, it'll show you. Uh, what I mean by double click is hit this button twice when you're highlighting it. It'll show you the blue and you can see that they are overlapping just like that. That, that is the correct answer. Okay, so you're taking the test. What should you observe to make you tell go to parametric? The T, if you see the letter T, use parametric. All right, so I'm going to skip in your packets. The next time you see a problem with a T, that happens to be problem number three. You come to number three, and it says, which graph represents the curve by the equation x equals 3t squared? And I'm going to pause as soon as you see 3t squared. What should go through your mind? Parametric. You should think parametric. As soon as you see that t you think ah parametric so i'm gonna go i'm just gonna clear mine out every time you don't have to clear your calculator every time i will i'm gonna hit uh no i don't want to save this and i'm gonna add a graph how do we get to parametric again graph entry four for parametrics you can hit four you can go click on it or you can hit the keypad for the number next to it parametric okay it gives us the x equation three t squared perfect the y equation, this does not say y equals though. It's supposed to say y equals. What do we need to do here? We're gonna have to do some algebra. All right, so looking at there, first thing first, if I'm trying to isolate the y, there's two options. What's the opposite of a, uh, remember when you do al algebra, you do opposites, that's, that's algebra basics. If you're going to solve or isolate this y, what's the opposite of a square root? A square. And what's the opposite of minus thing two? Uh, two. Question is, which one do I have to do first? I hear the squared. Why do I have to do the squared first? Because if I added two, it would not be inside a square root. That is inside a square root. So I have to get the square root first to the spirit. So squaring is the opposite. Those cancel over there. And so that means we're left with t squared equals y minus two. Great, almost done. Last step to isolate the y, you already told me, what is the opposite of a minus two? Plus two, once we've done this, we have isolated our y squared. I'm adding this to not inside a squared, so it's not gonna go inside that squared. It's gonna be t squared plus two equals y. And since they're equivalent, you can switch the order, that's not a big deal. So when I come over here, I'm gonna say y equals, T squared plus two, T squared plus two. They did not give me a restriction whatsoever. So what do we do in the calculator for the restriction? What a negative five, zero. What about that 6.28? Just leave it, you know what 6.28 is? It's two pi, that's exactly right, it's two pi. It's based off of here you use like a unit circle. Because it takes two pi to go all the way around. That's what that's there for. Okay, you press enter. That's what the graph should look like, at least something like this. Which graph somewhat resembles? D. If you're wondering why is it not exactly, any takers on why it's not exactly like the same? Here's when we change the equation, notice T is always squared. So even if you plug in a negative sign, what happens with a negative when it's squared? Becomes positive because both equations now have a positive T squared. No matter what, it can only, for the calculator, it can only produce a positive graph. Whereas the equation wasn't actually in the beginning a squared, was it? So for that reason, this shows the whole line, whereas the graph only shows the positive X, Y's and X's because they're being squared, they can't be negative. So that's why, if you're wondering. All right, why did we use parametric again? Because we saw a T. All right, moving forward, where's the next time we see a T? Number 16. Number 16. 
Number 16. Okay, I wanna, before I even, so here's the problem. Which graph represents the curve by the parametric? That's already telling you parametric right there. It's already, whoops, it's telling you parametric. But even if you didn't notice that, you get here and we see a T. So you now know it's parametric. So I'm gonna go new document and I'm not gonna save, I'll hit graph, menu, graph entry, which is number three followed by parametric. And I wanna pause there for a second. I'm gonna to talk to you about these graphs. Uh, so you might be typing, just pause just for a moment, because I wanna tell you something very important just to help you not select something stupid or to make from 50-50 before you ever get going. In case you're running out of time and you just gotta guess, you can eliminate a couple choices here very quickly. Time, does time always move from the future to the past or from the past towards the future? Which way does time always move? Past to future, smallest to largest. When you look at this, the arrow is showing which way the time is moving. Look at answer choice F. It's saying time is moving from time two to time negative two. Does that make sense? No, F is a bad choice. It's impossible. You cannot move from positive time to negative time. That doesn't work that way. Try G. What's happening on G? It's moving from negative two to positive two. Is that a possibility? Yes. That's a possibility. What about H? It's going positive two to negative two. Is that a possibility? No, this one's out as well. What about J? It's going from negative to positive. So it's 50-50 now. We've already eliminated those two without even graphing. That's because time's got to go from the smallest number to the largest number. And negatives are always smaller than positives. Okay, so now back over here, let's just go ahead and graph it and see what we get. Negative two T squared plus one. That's our X equation. Our Y equation is two T minus three. Notice this time they do give us a time interval. So we're not gonna plug in the negative five. This time we're gonna plug in exactly what they gave us. Since they gave us a time interval, we will use that. Negative two is less than or equal to T, which is less than or equal to two. Don't worry about the T step. That is for the calculator. That is not something you actually deal with in that. That's just telling the calculator how, honestly, the calculator is gonna graph this as a series of a bunch of dots really close together. That's telling the calculator how close to put the dots. That's all that's doing. So that's what the graph is supposed to look like. You can look at the two pictures. You can't eliminate based off that. So how will we get our answer? Easiest way I think is by tracing. Press menu. Menu. Choose trace, then graph trace. When I did, when I click graph trace, it starts me off at the bottom. It doesn't matter where it starts you off for. What I want you to notice is at the bottom of your screen, it'll show you the time value. And so this is saying right now, it gives you the X and the Y inside the parentheses, but then it gives you the time value over here. It's telling me my time equals negative two is when it's at this cross here. So time is negative two at the bottom of the graph. Now, if yours starts somewhere else, you can just use the right arrows and left arrows to move it around. But you can see as you move it around that time equals two would be the very top of the graph. Let me go all the way to time equals two. There it is. Time equals two when it's at the top of the graph. So which one's the correct answer? G. G is the correct answer. This one's it. That was by using trace, graph trace. That's how I got that. Any questions over that problem? All right, I got, I think one more parametric, number 26, and then I'll move on to projectile motion. So one more, 26. Now, 26 says, what are the parametric equations? I'm gonna pause again. As soon as you see this, what should you think you can do to solve the problem? Graph entry parametric. Perfect. But before we do that, let's just keep reading here for a second. What are the parametric equations for the curve given by the parameter t equals x plus 6? And the rectangular, rectangular, by the way, for our calculator, they don't say rectangular. Uh, they will use this as a relation. 
Okay, so first, I'm going to eliminate an answer for us by knowing just a little bit of algebra. You see these equations over here? Each answer choice has an equation solved for x and an equation solved for y. This over here, we could solve for x super quick. And so I'm going to use basic algebra to eliminate a couple of answer choices. How would I get this x isolated? What's the opposite of subtracting 6? If we add 6 to both sides, we should have x solved by itself and have that equation. We have t plus 6 equals x. So look at your answer choices. Which ones do not have x equals t plus 6? I reversed the order. G does not. G is out. And a second G, which should be J. Here on my, on my screen. I know your packet's updated, but those two are out. So it's already 50-50. So I'm going to graph this. I'm going to start with the relation portion because I know that's a part of the problem. I might type this in. It might be right. It might be wrong. And so I might have to change that one. So I want to start with the relation first. The one thing I know I'm not going to have to change. So I'm going to go new document. Don't save. Not that there, you have to do it in this order, but I'm going to do the relation first because no matter what I know. So menu, graph entry. No matter what, I know I'm not going to change this relation. This one's going to stay the same. So I'll do this one first. Y equals 5X minus 33. Press enter. There's my graph. Pardon me? I don't have Okay. Okay. Uh, I don't remember what I was saying other than here's the line. Now let's try, try answer choice F. So I'm going to go menu, graph entry. And I want to choose relation, uh, not relation, parametric this time. Just to make the colors different, I'm not going to type it in as X1, Y1. I'm going to press the down arrow and go to X2, Y2, just because this will switch my colors. Now I'll be in red. My calculators, the inspires, they always do the one the equation one in blue and the number two in red. So I'm going to do this here. So X, X2 is going to equal T plus six. Again, I'm just putting in two, so it would be a different color. And Y is 5T minus three. 5T minus three, press, oh, it doesn't give me a time at all. What should we do for time? Change that to a negative five. That'll just show you a little bit more of the image to make it easier to see if it's correct or incorrect. What do you think? Is that the right answer or incorrect answer? That's the good, that's a great answer right there. That's it. So we don't even need to try another. And I lied to you. I told you this is the last one before projectile motion, but I've remembered since I've been working this. I do have one more. I got one more with points. Number 27. Which pair of parametric equation represents a line that passes through the points 2, 1, and 0, 3? So I, this came up earlier. We did it on the bell ringer. And then we did it on another problem, I think. Or maybe it's just on the bell ringer today. Sorry, it's just on the bell ringer, wasn't it? How do you plot these two points? Do you remember? Do you remember how to plot points? Uh, I wish it was that easy. Let me go to new. I'm gonna go to graph. I wish it was as easy as just saying um, menu. Graph entry relation. I wish it was this easy where you could just do parentheses. I don't think this works. Yeah, that doesn't work. Do y'all remember how I plotted that point earlier today? Yeah, you go menu, geometry, points and lines, points by coordinates. I'm sure there's an easier way of doing this that I don't know of yet. But for now, I know this one works. Geometry. Points and lines, points by coordinates. Type in the value two, you press enter. Two, enter, one, enter. Plus that point. It'll give you this little pencil if you want to draw the next one on there at zero, negative three. You could do that. You could literally go to zero, negative three and just draw it like that, click it. But uh, if you don't want to risk messing up, just go menu, geometry, points and lines, points by coordinates. And again, do it zero, enter, negative three, enter. And there's the point. Uh, you press the escape, get rid of the pencil. So we want a graph that goes through those two points. So now I'm just going to start 
checking them out. It tells us it's parametric. It tells us here, parametric. It also, you can see all the T's. You can see all those T's. So what we need to do is menu, analyze graph, or not analyze graph, I'm sorry, graph entry, parametric. Uh, the first equation, negative two T. How many uh, curiosity have already gone ahead and got the answer? Nobody yet? Okay, good. Uh, if it doesn't give you the time, what should we put for time? Negative five. Negative five. Press enter. What do y'all think? Correct or incorrect? Incorrect. Incorrect. It doesn't go through it. So I'm going to press tab. And it'll, well, every time you press tab, it'll give you a blank equation. Uh, I'm going to go up arrow to change my original one. It'll go faster this way. So I press up. I'm going to change x1. So now I'm going to change to negative 2t and negative 8t plus 3. Negative 8t plus 3. What do you all think about answer choice B? Nope, it's not it either. Tab, up. I'm going to change this equation now to a positive 2t and a 4t minus 3. What do you all think about that one? That's it. That would be your answer. All right, that wraps up that portion of parametrics. Any questions on the T problems? Do y'all feel pretty good about those now? How did y'all goes out? All right, great. I, I believe on the test on the, they give the teachers, they let us know what a teaks. There are three different teaks in pre-calculus that go over um, parametrics. And there's a total of five questions. I think one of them is gonna be the real world, which I'm about to show you. Four of them will be like the ones we just did. If my memory serves me right, okay. All right, uh, let's talk about the real worlds. So how does a real world parametric look like? It's what a real world parametric is, is something moving over time. It's projectile motion is what we call it. Number five is an example. I got two examples for you here. A kicker in a football game attempts a, 50, a field goal 50 yards from the goalpost. Okay, so I want to pause for a moment. Imagine we have a football player over here about to kick a ball. So there they are. I'm going to just do a red X for the ball. They're going to kick the ball. And what they wanted to do, just so you know, if you don't know football, when they kick this ball, they don't want the ball to go under. What they want the ball to do is go up and over and inside this section in here. They want the ball to land inside of here. Okay. So on the answer choices, I'm going to skip this reading just for a second. The answer choices say there's options. This kicker might kick the ball and maybe it lands before it ever hits the goalpost. There's a possibility that the kicker kicks it and it goes far enough, but it just goes underneath. It goes back down here somewhere. That's answer choice B. Answer choice C says, uh, they kick it and it passes over. So it's a good kick. It goes right through the center in there. And so you would get points, three points to be exact. Or answer choice D, the ball hits the crossbar, so you cannot be determined. If you know soccer better, it's the same thing as when someone kicks at the soccer goal. All you're told is the ball hits the crossbar. You don't know the result because the ball could ricochet in. It might ricochet out. It might hit the crossbar so solid it might bounce back at you. You don't know. So that's the situation we're trying to let's figure out what unfolded when this happened. Okay, let's come back up and see the problem. What are the important values they give us? I see a 50. 50 yard, the uh, football, a kicker in a football game attempts a field goal 50 yards from the goal post. All right, let's start with that 50. What is that referring to? That's the distance from this crossbar here or from the Goal to the kicker, which that distance right there is 50 yards. Okay. The ball is on the ground. That is very important. The ball is on the ground. That's going to come up in a second. So that's a very important piece of information. The ball's on the ground and is kicked with an initial velocity of 81 feet per second. This is also important. So circle that up. Initial velocity, 81 feet per second. 
at an angle of 66 degrees. Y'all think that's important? You bet. The height of the crossbar of the goalpost is 10 feet. That is also important. The height of the crossbar is 10 feet. That is labeled on our diagram already. That's this piece right here. That's shown in the diagram. Okay, so how do you solve one of these problems? You're gonna go to the formula chart and it's on the trig side. On the trig side, I want you to scroll down to the bottom where it says projectile motion. You'll see two formulas down there, both a vertical position and a horizontal. Well, actually you see more than two formulas, but those are the only two you will use along with G over here. G stands for gravity. There's two gravity values. One is if you're in feet, it's 32 feet per second squared. And the other one's the one you're familiar with from science, I'm sure, 9.8 meters per second squared. If you're in meters, that's the, the value there. Both of these two are equivalent. 32 feet is equivalent to 9.8 meters. If you measured it out, those are equivalent values. Okay, so these are our two positions for the calculator, because I know the calculator is going to put X on top of Y. I'm going to write my horizontal distance formula on top of my vertical position formula. So over here, let's write out our formulas. The formulas are X equals T V zero cosine theta. That's the horizontal position. And my second value, is, or second equation is the, excuse me, that was horizontal distance. This is called vertical position, T, V zero, sine theta. Notice so far the only thing different is cosine is X, sine is Y. But the Y value gets gravity pulling on it. So minus one half GT squared plus H zero. What also is relevant to the, to the y value, I mean, y is up and down, is the initial height. The initial height has nothing to do with how far left or right it moves, nor does gravity have anything to do with left and right. Gravity only deals with up and down. That's why those two pieces are on the y and only the y. So let's plug in our information here. This 50 yards we had is going left and right. What value do you think that is, or what variable do you think that would represent the problem? X, very well said, that is X. There's one problem, that is in yards. Everything else is in feet. Does anybody know how to convert a feet to a feet to yards? That's right, one yard, one yard equals three feet. So let's convert this. If it's 150, I just gave you the answer, whoops. Okay, if it's 50 yards, then you'd multiply it by three and you would get 150 feet. So 150, that is an X value because it's going left and right. We are gonna solve here with our calculator. With these calculators, I don't even go through the graphing business. I use NSolve because it's really quick and really easy. I'm gonna put 150 in for X. The T, we don't know. We have no idea how much time it is. So I'm gonna skip that. And I'm gonna go to initial velocity. Scan through the problem. What was our initial velocity? We circled every number we saw plus the ground because that matters. 81. So 81 is going to be V0, which 81 or V0 occurs on both equations. So put 81 for both of those. Next variable is the theta. What is our theta in the problem? 66. Good. That takes care of the X equation on the Y equation. Uh, G, gravity. What's your gravity value we're gonna use? The 32 feet per second squared or the 9.8 meters per second squared? We're gonna use this one, the 32 feet, because that's in feet. So we're gonna say 32 feet per second. That's the G we're gonna use, 32 feet per second squared. So 32 goes in there. Again, we don't know how much time takes place, but we do know the initial height. What was the initial height of the ball? Uh, that's the height of the goalpost. What's the height of the ball at the start? Zero. Zero, it's on the ground. That was that part that I said is really important. The on the ground means it starts at zero. So what is the 10 then? 
how high is the goal for its goal? That's right. That is the y value here. And that's what we're going to compare this equation to in a second. So here's how we're going to do this. We're going to end solve this top equation to find out how much time it takes for the ball to go that distance. Then we'll plug in that time into this equation to get the height of the ball and compare the height to the crossbar. Does that make sense? Great. So here we go. To end solve, you press menu three, one. Menu three, one. It says end solve here. I'm going to type in just the X equation. So uh, 150 equals T times, uh, I'm gonna hit, when variables are next to each other like that, that means multiply. So since I'm replacing with a number, I need to put times. T times 81, the cosine you don't, it'll know 81 cosine, it knows to multiply. You could do eight, uh, times if you wanted to. Cosine 66. I need to pause because I see a degree symbol. Check your calculator. Are you in degree mode? If you're not, let's just say yours says RAD in the top right. All you have to do is highlight it and click it with the center button and it'll change the degree. All right, I type this in and I press enter. It's going to say error to few arguments. What have I forgotten to do? Comma T, because that'll solve for T. Okay, I do it there. It says error to few arguments. What did I do wrong? It doesn't go on the outside. It goes inside uh, right before the very last parentheses. That's where it goes. So now you do comma T and you should get an answer. Now, I don't want to confuse people. What you can do is now that we know the time, we can now say we discovered... Uh, what color have I not used yet? Orange. We can put down here, we discovered that the time is 4.55295. And you could just plug that in there and there. Now that we know that, we could take that and plug it in. But in the calculator, if you know how to do this, this is a quicker way. You can store this. What do I mean by store? It saves in the calculator. You see this button right here uh, above the, it says VAR, but in mine it's blue. On yours, I think it's in yellow or gray. You see it, yours says stow with an arrow. You see that? If you just hit control VAR for variable, control variable, what it'll do is it'll store this answer. I want to store it as the, just the letter T. So I want to put stow or control variable, and then I'm going to hit T and press enter. Now, the calculator has put all this in as T and it saved it. So what does that mean? Now I can just type in this equation. I'm not gonna type the Y equals. I'm gonna type it in just like this and it's actually gonna calculate how high the ball is. So I'm gonna press T and see how the calculator went bold on that T because it knows what that variable is now. T times 81 sine of 66 minus, I'm gonna hit control divide to get a fraction. One half times 32 times T squared plus zero, just like that. So now the calculator will give me this exact answer. It says the height of the ball is 5.23 feet. So if the height of the ball, when it flies off over here, if it's 5.23 feet, that means it's approximately right there. That's the height of the ball. Let me get this person off the air. There we go. If that's where the height of the ball is, tell me which one's true. Does the ball hit the ground before reaching the goalpost? No. no. Does the ball pass under the crossbar? Yes, B is the correct answer. So, by the way, the ball would fly off. And it would have this type of path like this. If you were going to get an answer that uh, the ball hits the ground beforehand, what you would have gotten for a Y is a negative answer. Because if it was going to hit the ground before it got to the crossbar, it would go up and hit the ground in front like this. And the calculator would solve it all the way to this moment in time. And so it would give you a negative Y. That's what it would do if, the, if A was going to be correct. If C was going to be correct, it would give me a value bigger than 10. If it passes over, it would have been a value bigger than 10. If D was correct, it would have been exactly 10. Does that make sense?
All right, I have a DOL for you. I'm gonna let you try this. Use the same two formulas. By the way, if you want to graph this and trace your graph, you can do that as well. I'll do that really fast. I'm gonna to try to go fast here. If you wanted to use parametric equations, you could go graph, graph entry, parametric, T times 81, cosine, oh, it's not even typing, T, come on, T times 81, cosine 66, check my modem and degrees, good. Uh, T times 81, sine 66, minus one half times 32 T squared plus zero. I don't need to worry about negative time because you can't kick the ball in negative. I'm gonna go window zoom so you can see it all, which you would need to do if you're gonna solve this problem. Okay, so there's the fly of the ball right there. And if you were gonna use this graph, what you would then do is I would just add a relation. They don't have the Y equals 10 or X equals 150 in yet. I wasn't able to plug that in on parametric. So I'm gonna just do a relation that says only an X and Y, graph entry relation. And I wanna say X equals 150 down Y equals 10, these two equations. And notice what happens, menu, let me zoom back in now, zoom in. If you graph them like that, you could see what the ball does. So here's the ball. That's 150 feet. That's 10 feet high, or that's 150 way, feet away. As the ball approaches, that's where the crossbar would be. This little point right here, come on. This point right there is represented where these two lines intersect, right there. That what happens with the ball? Does it go over, under, hit it, or hit the ground beforehand? So what's the ground? The ground is this line. This is the ball. This is the crossbar height. That's the distance away the crossbar is. See how the ball would travel underneath it? And so that would not work out. Uh, I'll make it a faster kick and you'll see one that would have been good. Let's say it was this. You see now how the ball would cross over it? That's what it would look like if it was good. And I'll do another one. This is be hitting the ground beforehand. That would be, it hits the ground before it gets to the crossbar there. So you could do it through this graph as well. You just plug all this in and then you would do an, a relation x equals 150 y equals 10 to get the line to see where it's what you're comparing it to okay so with all that i came up with a problem this is not on your packet i want you to try this dol dol number five i want you uh, or it's a problem like number five i want you to do the same thing for this problem okay this baseball player problem i'll pause the video and give you a chance uh to work this out on your own let's see what you come up with And I have a typo on this as well. This seems to be a 405. All right, now we're gonna put projectile motion and parametrics to rest. And I wanna cover some random trigonometry is what I call it. These are the easiest questions. If you have a good game plan for how to do these problems, they are super easy all the way through. Uh, it talks about trig values, quadrant, quadrants, reference angles, and uh, I should put on there uh, coterminal. I think coterminal could possibly be tested. And so I will talk about that, though I don't have a problem for that on this test. All right, so that's what we're going to cover. So first, what is the exact value of tangent negative 14 pi over 3? What trig means is you're using sine, cosine, tangent cosecant, secant, cotangent, using one of those. You come to a problem, a lot of this, when I say basic trig, is just because it's not going to be word problems. They're just going to be the basic math. It says, what is the value of this tangent? Well, you can use your calculator to solve for those. The key is to make sure you're in the right mode. So I'm going to add a calculator. If you see a pi, what mode is pi in always? Pi is a radian. Pi is a measure of how many radiuses go along the arc length of a circle and that's what the name radius not radius radians comes from 
a radian is one radius along the arc length or the circumference of a circle. So uh, for a calculator, if you ever see a pi, it has to be a radian. Pi would be 3.14 radiuses along the outside of the circle. That's what that is. Okay, so I go to tangent here and inside the parentheses, I'm gonna hit negative, control divide, 14. The pi button is in the bottom left. You'll see pi with an arrow, you click that. There's the pi and put that over three, press enter. I get 1.73205. I'm looking, that's a positive number. So that eliminates F and G. And not only that, J says undefined. The calculator would tell you if it's undefined. If you don't believe me, if you don't believe me, I will prove it to you. The calculator would tell you if it's undefined. Pi over two is where it's undefined. So it would tell you, so it's not that. That means it must be the square root of three. Let's double check. Control X squared, that means square root. Check them, are those the same? Yeah, yeah answer's H. All right, so a plan with basic trig is either type it in if it gives it straight to you, or if it doesn't, I will use sine or cosine. That's just what, what I'm gonna do. Unit circle is not given to you on the test. Yep, unit circle is not given to you. All right, number 11, which angle has a negative sine value and a negative cotangent? Well, this is telling you exactly what to do. Use sine and cotangent, and we're gonna test with these angles to see which one it is. So what do I mean by that? Let me clear my calculator. What I'm going to type in is sine, so press the trick button, sine, and I'm going to use pi over 7. Again, what mode would pi over 7 be in? That's radians. So check your calculator in the top right. Make sure you're in radians. How do you switch it again if you need to? Just click it like that. When I hit enter, it gives me 0.433. Is that a positive or negative number? Positive. What's it supposed to be? Sine. Needs to be negative. A is out. So I'm going to do it again. Uh, I pressed up arrow twice to highlight it, and then I press enter on it just to copy it. So I'm now going to change it to 5 pi divided by 8. Press enter. I get a positive number. Does that mean it's a correct answer choice or incorrect? It's incorrect. There's, it's impossible. I shouldn't say correct or incorrect. All right. I don't know if it would necessarily be correct, but either way, it is incorrect, absolutely. Now I will try four pi over three. Uh, four pi divided by three. Ah, I got a negative. Good so far, right? So now I need to check the cotangent. Do y'all remember what the word, the letters are for cotangent? COT, great, because if you do, you can just copy that again and change the SIN. And I'm just going to type in C-O-T. So that way I don't have to do the angle. C-O-T, hit enter. It's positive. Is it supposed to be positive? So the answer has to be by process of elimination, D. I'll check it just to make sure. So I'm going to copy the sign and do 9 pi over 5. That's a negative. That's good. And I'll change the sign to a cotangent now. C O T, C O T. That's also a negative. So that is our answer. Okay. So a good plan for basic trig. You just type it in, and what we'll see in a second is if they don't give you a trig function, I just use sine or cosine, which is going to come up here in a second. Uh, for the sake of time, I need to pass this DOL. All right, uh, let's go on to number 12. This is the one thing you might need to remember from basic trig. The thing that you need to remember, not might, the thing you do need to remember are your ratios. So I'm gonna write them out on the side. Actually, I gave them to you earlier. Let me see if I can find it. Right here, these. Pull it paste. You need to remember these for your exam here. Okay, you need to remember these trig functions. All right, I, I don't know. My guess is they won't, there's nothing on there that was gonna, on the test or on the formula chart that's gonna tell you these values. So you need to remember these. 
Uh, this why at the beginning of the year, literally the beginning of 2022, I said sine is y, cosine is x, tangent is y over x. You remember me saying that so many times that first day? Sine is y, cosine is x, tangent is y over x with the silent mm -hmm. h's. If you press the trig button, you'll see that they go in the same order. So you can get your reciprocals if you know these three, because you know sine, cosine, tangent, and then here's a the reciprocals, CSC, secant, cotangent in order. So sine is y, cosine is x, tangent is y over x. You need to be able to remember that because on the test, you won't have that right there to help you out. Okay, so cosine. What is cosine's ratio? X over h. So we know x divided by h equals seven divided by 25, which means we know x and we know h. Here it says tangent is less than zero. Well, what is tangent? Oh, y'all are right. But what is tangent's ratio? So y divided by x is less than zero. We all are saying it's negative. I agree with that. But we know what x is. What is x? So y divided by seven is less than zero. All right, if I wanted to isolate the y, how do you get rid of this division of seven? To isolate that y, what's the opposite of dividing by seven? Okay, so if I multiply both sides by seven, I can make an observation about y. Y must be less than, what is zero times seven? Zero. zero. Y has to be less than zero. One more time, translation. Y is negative. The problem asks, what is the value of CSC? What is CSC's ratio? C of C comes right after the tangent, so it's got to be the reciprocal sign. That means it is H over Y. Well, we know what H is. What's H? 25. And we know Y is negative. We don't know what negative what, but we know it's negative. So I need 25 and I need a negative, one negative. So 25 in the numerator. Oh, that's 24 in the numerator. That's out. 24. Okay, these two have 25 in the numerators, but what's the problem with J? It's positive, there's no negative. So this one's wrong there. It'd be a, if you needed, if there was multiple uh, options there, just do the Pythagorean theorem. Do the Pythagorean theorem to get your X or your Y. All right, so that's the one basic trig problem that you need to actually know, have some knowledge to solve. The rest are pretty easy. Uh, let's skip on to 21. I know it doesn't say DOL. I'll let you do this on your own. Figure out what it's going to be. I'll get ready to calculate it, but I'm going to let you do it and tell me what you get. I'm guessing a lot of people typed in. Press enter. I'm getting this number. It's a negative. I know it's not negative one half. The answer must be A. Problem. When I try A, it's not accurate. What have I done wrong? I'm still in radians. What am I supposed to be in? All right. I'm going to switch that. I'm going to go back up and copy this. I press up to highlight it. Press enter on it. This time when I, well, Coincidentally, the answer is still A, but uh, the first time it was my mode was wrong. So make sure your mode is correct, but this answer would be A. All right, and now we get to reference angles, and I'm going to talk about coterminal as well. There's a big difference. So a reference angle, by way of reminder, what a reference angle is, is it, uh, it relates a circle to a triangle. So when we were dealing with the unit circle, we learned a few things in particular. Oh no, my computer's freezing up. Okay, unit circle, and I'll just get a different, I'll leave it black. Okay, when we were dealing with the unit circle, that was the first day in chapter four.
that we introduced values can be negative. And so this was lesson 4.3. In lessons 4.1 and 4.2, we only dealt with triangles. In triangles, everything is positive. We got to the unit circle and we said, okay, there's values on the left side in quadrants two and three where the X would be negative. And there's values in quadrants three and four where the Y's would be negative down here. And so we could determine positive and the negatives. Well, as you relate it to a triangle, here's the deal with the triangle. Every single triangle only has positive values. So what happens when the value is supposed to be, whoops, that didn't work for me. Let me uh, flip this, I thought it was gonna work better. Let's say this way, did that work? Still not right, flip. That's still not right. There we go. Perfect. Okay, so what happens if you have an angle that's all the way around the third quadrant and you're gonna relate it to a triangle? What you would do is you would draw a triangle here and you would come up with what's called a reference angle. The reference angle you list as a theta with a prime, that's how they did it, like that. And it would refer to the angle from here to here. And it would just be a positive number, which means it would be equivalent to the same angle going this way in the first quadrant. First quadrant kind of like this. Let me just draw this one, be quicker. This would be the same angle. Those two would be equivalent to one another. So that's another theta prime. Notice those are equivalent to each other. They should look exactly the same. So a reference angle, here's what it means. It should give you the same value of X and Y, numerical value of X and Y, each point, have the same numerical value for X and Y. However, the negatives don't matter. So over here, this would produce a negative X and a negative Y. This will produce a positive X and a positive Y, but the decimal values will be exactly the same. So how do you do it if you see reference angle? I would suggest you just use sine of negative 17 pi over four. And you wanna see what answer choice is the first one. Again, the first one, you want it the smallest possible that gives you the same numerical value. Uh, said otherwise, if you took the absolute value, it should equal this one of these answer choices. So I'm going to first try pi over four and see if this is the case. So it doesn't matter if negatives or positives, whatever that spits out. So I want to go to the calculator. You could do absolute value. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to hit trig, hit sine of negative 17 pi over four. Now, if I press enter right now, I will have a problem. What's going to be my problem here? I'm in degrees. What mode should I be in? I'm going to switch to radians. I'm going to press enter. So that's the decimal value I'm looking for. I want the smallest possible answer for reference angle, the smallest possible answer that gives me exactly that. So now I'm going to try again. Well, it doesn't have to be the negative, but the decimal value the same. I'll try pi over four. Okay. Do the decimals match up? Then this is the correct answer. Because with this, the negatives do not matter. With a reference angle, the negatives do not matter. However, if it said coterminals, then it would. And you need to be exactly the same. If it was coterminal, you need exactly the same. And you'd have to test both sine and cosine. Both the x and the y's have to be exactly the same. If it's reference angle, you could just try one. And the negatives do not matter. So that's how you would do that. And let's see. I think I got one more maybe. Yep, one more. You try number 25, and then we'll call a wrap. So again, you can just try, since it says reference angle, you can just try just sine or just cosine. First value that gives you the same decimals, ignoring the negatives or positives, will be your correct answer. Make sure you change the degree mode. 